was really good. Why are they saving it for six? I don't know. We'll, we'll be offended by that a little bit later. <laughs> Thank but... you all. Still coming up, we're going to tell you about a man arrested after videotaping the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Jim Vance and Dorian Gensler are next with News 4 at 6. You're watching NBC4, working for you. Live from the area's leading news station, this is News 4 at 6. The Chesapeake Bay Bridge, an iconic figure of the greater Washington landscape, and maybe a terrorist target. Good evening. I'm Jim Vance. I'm Doreen Gensler. That may have been what a couple of off-duty police officers had in mind when they stopped some people shooting videotape of the bridge and allegedly doing some reconnaissance for a terrorist group. Julie Carey is at the bridge now. She has more. Ishmael Elbarasi's wife tells News 4 she and her husband were just headed home to Annandale from a Delaware beach vacation with their three children when police pulled them over Friday at the west end of the Bay Bridge just before the toll plaza. Elbarasi's wife said she'd been videotaping the bridge and bay, sightseeing pictures, she calls them. But in this affidavit, federal investigators accuse Elbarasi and his wife of, quote, providing reconnaissance and surveillance to a foreign terrorist organization, namely Hamas. It was about 1.30 Friday afternoon when Marine officers noticed El Barassi's wife videotaping the bridge structure. But they say she lowered the camera when she spotted them. Observed um, individuals of Middle Eastern descent um, videotaping what appeared to be them to be videotaping the structure of the bridge. Soon after, Maryland Transit Authority police pulled over the SUV and asked for the camera and tape. El Barassi's wife told officers they were merely taping scenery, then asked, is it a crime to videotape a bridge? Sources call the video seized troubling. Investigators say while the tape does contain some family vacation footage, it also includes video that begins about a mile east of the bridge, shots of the cables and upper supports of the main span. Portions of footage reportedly zooms in on the bridge joints. El Barassi's attorney says the allegations of taping for Hamas are politically motivated. The allegations pertaining to Hamas are rubbish. They date back to before 1997 when Hamas was not a designated terrorist organization. There is absolutely nothing new in this grand jury case in Chicago other than John Ashcroft's desperate need to win votes for George Bush. El Barassi is now being held as a material witness because of his alleged ties to several Hamas leaders who were indicted last week, accused of funneling millions of dollars to Hamas to carry out terrorist attacks. At El Barassi's Annandale home today, his wife called the allegations of videotaping for Hamas, quote, stupid. But Maryland Governor Robert Ehrlich says the case illustrates homeland security is working. There is a uh, war going on around the world by people who simply want to do us great harm. But again, Ishmael El Barassi is simply being held as a material witness. He has not been charged with anything in connection with the videotaping. Now, in all, agents seized seven videotapes and a cell phone from the SUV. They also obtained a search warrant to go into the El Barassi home in Annandale and to look into the personal computer there and seize items there. Reporting live from the Bay Bridge, I'm Julie Carey. Back to you. Julie, thank you. Jim? One day after a local waiter was shot and killed during a robbery attempt in DuPont Circle, Police say they have seen a spike in crime in that area. Early this morning, there was another attempted robbery in the area. Jackie Benson is in DuPont Circle now with an update on all this. Jackie? Well, Jim, police confirm robberies are up in this area. Tonight, we will see additional police patrols, officers on horseback, canine officers walking the streets. Sources tell News 4 the car pursued by 3rd District officers after a street robbery at 19th and S Streets just after midnight is similar to the description of the getaway vehicle used in another robbery in the DuPont Circle area last week. Pursuing officers stopped the white Buick on South Capitol Street Southeast. The driver bailed out and ran. An 18-year-old passenger was arrested. He's not talking. Sources tell News 4 the missing driver resembles the suspect in the murder of 55-year-old Adrian Alstead, killed during an apparent robbery at 18th and our streets northwest as he was walking home from work. Meanwhile, the DuPont Circle community continues to mourn Allstadt, who worked as a waiter at Annie's Steakhouse on 17th Street. D.C. Council member Jack Evans stopped by there today. We do live in a city, and I always try and caution everybody to just be careful when you're out at night. Even though neighborhoods look safe, they can become unsafe very quickly, as this did. And so, uh, but uh, we'll be talking with the chief, already talked with the commander about stepping up patrols around here, because we've had a couple of incidents. 
A local church has organized a prayer vigil for Adrian Allstead. It will be held tonight at 10 at DuPont Circle. Doreen, or Jim, back to you. Jackie Benson. Thank you, Jackie. Four detainees are being arraigned this week at Guantanamo Bay Naval Base in Cuba. These are the first U.S. military tribunals to take place since World War II. The first detainee to go before the military panel is a former chauffeur to Osama bin Laden. His name is Salim Ahmed Hamdan, and he's from Yemen. U.S. officials say Hamdan served as a bodyguard to bin Laden and delivered weapons to al-Qaeda operatives. Hamdan admits he was bin Laden's driver, but he denies taking part in terrorist activities. Some of the Pentagon's top leaders are under fire today for leadership breakdowns that led to the Abu Ghraib prison scandal. An independent panel found that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and other top leaders did not order the abuse at the Iraqi prison, but the panel says their policies allowed guards to run amok at the prison with virtually no rules. Brian Moore has our report. Who is to blame for these infamous scenes of shame, humiliation, and torture at Iraq's Abu Ghraib prison? An independent review ordered by the Pentagon says a small group of soldiers lost control. There was sadism on the night shift at Abu Ghraib, sadism that was certainly not authorized. It was kind of animal house. But the panel also indirectly blamed Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and the top military brass here at home for losing control of their troops and breakdowns in policy and supervision. We believe that there is institutional and personal responsibility right up the chain of command. Meanwhile, at a military court in Germany, another round of hearings for some of the seven soldiers charged in the Abu Ghraib incident. One of the soldiers accused of orchestrating these now notorious photographs has agreed to accept responsibility. The attorney for Staff Sergeant Chip Frederick says he and others working in a prison without rules lost their perspective in the fog of war. That's what happened here. These were basically decent people in an evil circumstance, and they succumbed. Frederick, his wife by his side, says he now feels ashamed. My family, my friends, all back home, all know that I'm not that kind of person. And even God knows that I'm not that kind of person. A new Army report being released on Wednesday is expected to be heavily critical of Lieutenant General Ricardo Sanchez. He was a top U.S. military leader in Iraq at the time of Abu Ghraib. The report is also expected to implicate as many as two dozen other soldiers in the incident. On Capitol Hill, Brian Moore, News 4. There was another suicide bombing attack in Baghdad today. The attack was aimed at the Iraqi environmental minister. She was traveling with a convoy in southern Baghdad when the bomb went off. She wasn't injured, but four of her bodyguards were killed along with the suicide bomber. A second attack targeted the education minister. He was on his way to work when a roadside bomb went off. He was not injured, but one of his bodyguards was killed. Meantime, the U.S. military mounted an overnight offensive in the city of Fallujah. U.S. aircraft and artillery lit up the night sky before dawn this morning. MSNBC reports that the airstrikes were aimed at areas where terrorists had been hiding out and storing weapons. The friends of a man who was fired for heckling President Bush protested his dismissal today. They did it outside the man's former company. Last Tuesday, Glenn Hiller heckled President Bush during a campaign rally in West Virginia. The next day... He was fired. His boss said his actions reflected badly on the company. Hiller says he believes his former boss is a good person. He says his friend's protests are misdirected. Several protest groups are fighting for a chance to be heard during the Republican National Convention in New York City next week. Yesterday, a federal judge denied permission for a major rally in Central Park. City officials have turned down requests from several groups because of uh, security concerns. The police say their resources will be stretched to home games for both Major League Baseball teams and the U.S. Open tennis tournament happening at the same time as the convention. For the first time today, Vice President Dick Cheney publicly acknowledged that one of his daughters is gay. At a town hall meeting in Davenport, Iowa, he was asked what he thinks about marriages between people of the same gender. The vice president said that his daughter, Mary, is gay, so it's an issue with which his family is very familiar. Mr. Cheney said that he believes that people ought to be free to enter into any kind of relationship and that he believes that states should decide how they want to regulate marriage. 
Meanwhile, Senator John Kerry was campaigning for the Democrats in New York. He blasted the Bush campaign and its allies. Kerry said his opponents are using what he called fear and smear tactics to avoid talking about real issues such as jobs, health care, and the war in Iraq. The speech took place at Cooper's Union. It's the site of an historic anti-slavery speech delivered by President Abraham Lincoln back in 1860. Still to come in our broadcast, the latest from Athens as the U.S. adds more medals to the collection. Plus, American gymnast Paul Hamm just can't escape controversy at these games. Also, our critical update for Windows users could clog up the information superhighway. And Bob, what's ahead in our weather forecast? Doreen, we had a lot more sunshine today and a bit more in the way of humidity, too. Uh, that's going to be around for a little while. A little steamy out there in the practice field, George. Absolutely. Hey, you know, Bob, the baseball talks are back in D.C. trying to find out if this is where the Expos come. The Rams get clipped by a former Redskin. And the head hog gets his offense going against the Dolphins. Joe Bugle joins us as News 4 at 6 continues. We're going to tell you the latest from the Olympics. We're going to tell you the latest from the Olympics in Athens now. This is when we warn you that some of the competition is not scheduled to air on TV until tonight. So if you don't want to know ahead of time, this is a good time to turn away just for a minute, though, because we'd love to have you back. George is out at the camp now with more on this. What's up, George? Good afternoon, Jim and Doreen. Well, American wrestler Rulon Gardner now advances to the semifinals today. You may recall Gardner won the Olympic gold medal four years ago in Sydney. He now advances to the semifinal. And the U.S. has placed only two boxers in the medal round of these Olympics. That's the fewest number of U.S. boxers in 56 years. And on the track, Joanna Hayes captured the gold in the women's 100-meter hurdles. While the fastest man in the world, he earned his title yesterday, ends up winning the 200 meters or qualifies for the 200 meters. Let me take you over to Athens. It was a guy that really just lit everybody up. Justin Gatlin, American runner that captured the title of world's fastest man yesterday, winning the men's 100 meters. Today, he qualified for the semifinals of the 200 meters along with his teammates, Sean Crawford and Bernard Williams. Lake Braddock High's Alan Johnson advances to the second round of the 110 meter hurdles today. He finished third in his heat Johnson won the gold in Atlanta back in 1996. And Joanna Hayes captured gold in the women's 100-meter hurdles in an Olympic record time of 12.37 seconds. Her teammate, by the way, Melissa Morrison, also took home the bronze medal. Olympics, you'll see them all live beginning later tonight here on NBC. Jill Bugle joins us later here from Redskins Park. Jim and Doreen. Thanks, George. U.S. athletes are getting further and further ahead of the competition as far as medals go. Americans have now won a total of 72 medals at these games, 25 gold, 28 silver, 19 bronze. China is next with 51 medals, 24 gold, 15 silver, 12 bronze. Russia comes up third, 48 medals, 9 gold, 18 silver, and 21 bronze. Some are now calling U.S. gymnast Paul Hamm the poster child for scrutiny at these Olympic Games. He won the gold in the men's all-around competition last week, a competition in which many say a scoring error kept a South Korean gymnast from the title. Then last night, another judging error put Hamm back in the spotlight. Michelle Franzen is live in Athens with the latest. Michelle, it's getting hard to keep track of all these controversies. It certainly is, Doreen, but there are a lot of people keeping track and making appeals and trying to get it all straightened out. Out. That has to do with the uh, controversy, as you mentioned, surrounding Paul Hom's all-around win. In the meantime, though, there, there, there were some other things shaking, and Mother Nature weighed in today with a 4.5 quake just northeast of Athens. It didn't create any damages and no injuries that were reported, but it shook a few of the venues. In the meantime, there was uh, some tense moments in the boxing ring in that match between Egypt, e Egypt and Greece. The crowd ended up turning on the Egyptian boxer, throwing some bottles and starting to boo him. 
him that after a referee called the match, saying that the Greek boxer's cuts that he sustained were just too much for him to continue on. And as you mentioned, the Paul Hom just cannot escape some of the controversy, the continuing uh, saga around his all-around win. Today, the International Federal Gymnastics uh, Federation of Gymnastics said it would not give the South Korean a duplicate gold medal. That is, unless Paul Hom decides to give up his own medal. And Paul Hom said he will not be doing that. He said that there were some judging mistakes made on both sides, favoring both. And a Washington native and former Olympian silver medalist says that changing the scoring results at this point would be nearly impossible and difficult. In our sport, obviously, it is subjective, and that is why we have developed these rules that things need to be determined on the spot. And um, I think that the rules set in place are very good. It was a little bit disappointing that the FIG had to open up this whole situation in my case because they are technically not even allowed to be reviewing the tapes in this matter. If you opened up Pandora's box and start looking at all of the routines, uh, the hundred or so routines that were out there, you could probably make cases left and right for this. And that's why uh, there is no video surveillance or video replay in the sport of gymnastics, just like baseball. The umpire makes the call, the manager can come out and yell and scream, and if he gets it overturned, he does. But you don't get to talk about it the next day. And I think it's something that all the gymnasts knew from day one before walking into the competition, what the rules were. This is not a surprise. And certainly, Doreen, that is something that you are talking about in the States and what it continues to be talked about here. The gymnastics team, though, tonight will put all that aside for their gala exhibition, and it should be a, a good one. Back to you. And we haven't heard the last of this gymnast uh, gold medal controversy. I don't think this is going to I'm afraid continue. not. All right, Michelle Franzen, live from Athens. Thank you. We'd like to know what you think about this. Should Paul Hom return the gold medal he won in the men's all-around competition? Log on to NBC4.com and take our online survey. And for everything on the Olympic Games, from biographies on the athletes to TV schedules, visit our Ozone section in our, on our website, NBC4.com. Microsoft is coming out with an important upgrade for its Windows operating system. And many are debating whether to upgrade or not. Uh, Jay Hudson will tell us about that. Another beautiful day outside today. How long can this go on? Bob Ryan will have some answers when we come back. Spitz reunion, the golden greats of U.S. swimming, their first interview together. That's, that's exciting. Head stern when I hit the beach with golden girl Amanda Beard. Next, Access Hollywood. Tonight at 7.30 on NBC4. You're watching News 4 at 6. Oh, we're still on a streak. Boy, we're, we're, nice we're sunny day, yeah. Yeah, yeah right and uh, a little bit more humidity, but uh, not bad. When Two years ago, we had almost not, not 20 90-degree days in August. Mm -hmm. and, and remember this, two and years this, ago? And this year, none? One. One? One. One measly one. Outside right now, uh, today, temperatures are into the 80s, but uh, especially in the morning, good time to get up, do a little bit of walking. Uh, ozone levels, the air quality doesn't take too great in the afternoon now with the air around that we have, although we're going to be seeing the southeasterly wind pick up, and that will help a little bit, bringing in some of that ocean air. We're losing, as we know, two minutes of sunlight each and every day now. Sunset tonight is uh, about 7.50, 86 degrees, our high temperature right now. We've still got that sunshine, though. Haven't let that uh, go away yet. With our current temperature, 83, the dew point 87, so the uh, humidity is up there about 60, 65 percent, but also increasing now is the pollen, ragweed, hay fever suffers, gets that ragweed gets to 20 to 23, and that's Silver Spring in Washington. It's uh, pretty noticeable. Here's what's going on and over us, our temperature here, 83. Look it up to our north. That northeasterly wind, an easterly wind has really cooled things off in uh, Boston, and the dew points right now are into the uh, 50s up there. Here's what's been going on over the last uh, 12 hours. There's that little weak weather front that you can almost see the clouds. There's a lot more moisture, humidity, and also some nasty thunder showers out to our west. There's a uh, severe thunderstorm watch in effect until uh, about uh, 8 o'clock. But in and around us, really nothing going on. 
going on around our foreign's neighborhood storm stations right now. Temperatures uh, still holding into the 80s. Back to school in Calvert County, 84 degrees. And again, there's that little easterly wind, which makes it a bit cooler around the bay. And that's the uh, feature over the next few days, too. An east to southeasterly wind, so it'll be warmer for you folks out toward the Blue Ridge and a bit cooler out near the water. Look at uh, Ocean City right now. Onshore breeze there with the uh, temperature 70 degrees. And that will be, again, as I mentioned yesterday, the feature throughout this week. Going to be cool out of the beaches as right now, again, uh, it is in Boston. Look at the mid part of the country. No sign, though, of any terrible heat, even Phoenix, uh, 96 degrees, and that's not too bad. Last couple of days, the jet has been dipping down out of the uh, northwest, and there have been a lot of clouds out there. And this is where the area of storminess is uh, out in, uh, around Missouri. But underneath that ridge in you know, us, we have an area of high pressure, so it's pretty stable, and the tropics for the time being are quiet. But let me take you into space. This is a tremendous image, a uh, movie from the um, International Space Station of Chaba. That's a super typhoon out in the Pacific. That eye that you can see in the upper part, the upper center part, is about 50 miles across. Winds are 160 miles per hour right now. And it is, unfortunately, moving toward the southern islands of Japan, perhaps for the weekend. Certainly bears watching, but what a dramatic picture. You can imagine the scale of that, literally over 1,000 miles across, a super typhoon on the Pacific. For us, we're not going to be seeing anything like that, but over the next 24 hours, rather, with that high pressure in on us and those east to uh, southeasterly winds, bring uh, in a bit of moisture from the ocean, but the main effect will be to keep our temperatures only in the low to mid 80s. Then as we get later into the week, some of that leftover moisture will be getting closer, and it may bring some clouds and some showers close to the mountains of West Virginia, but I don't think anything getting here until late in the weekend. Overnight tonight, then clear and mild, with temperatures only late tonight, mid to high 60s. Tomorrow, heading out to work and heading to school. A lot of morning sunshine. Could be some patchy fog around, so watch out for that. With moderate humidity, air quality will be cold yellow, and more of the same. On tap for Thursday, sunny, warm, still a little bit on the humid side, but again, nothing really oppressive compared to what we've had in other Augusts. Is that a word? No, August. Just that's August. Enough. Yeah. That's, that'll do that's it. enough. That'll do it. And then uh, late Saturday and into Sunday, that's uh, by the time, I think, late Sunday that we have a chance for some afternoon showers or thunder showers. Really not until then. And temperatures, again, staying in the mid 80s. Some of those cloud showers, I think, will linger into the first part of next week. Not bad for one August. Good, not good bad at all. Yeah. for people to be on vacation. It is wonderful, yeah. Too bad for us, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and back to school, I guess, too. Thank you. Okay. Microsoft is releasing a security upgrade to its Windows XP operating system. It is a fix that local businesses and universities are going to be taking a close look at. Ajay Hudson has our report. The upgrade focuses on security, turning on the built-in firewall, better protection from hackers and spyware. By default, we turn on stronger security settings on your PC. Second, we made sure that it was easier to manage, view, and change all your security settings. And third, we made sure that your online browsing experience was more secure. Service Pack 2 is not your typical Microsoft upgrade. A lot of businesses and universities are holding off because it may conflict with some of their applications. But other schools say they have no choice. They must go ahead with an upgrade for protection. We would rather take the risk of having this in place than up for the certainty that our systems would be continue to be vulnerable to serious attack from people that would try to exploit computers that they knew had not installed this, the service packs. Carl Whitman runs e-operations for American University and says students will see posters all over campus asking them to be a good network citizen. New students at American University get their laptops set up for wireless and are told about the upgrade and to set Windows Update on automatic so new patches are installed as soon as they're available. We will be directing them to do that, and we're also going to have tech support people assisting with that as well. So we want to make sure they're set up properly. At home, I always had my dad do it for me because he works with computers, so he just would fix everything for me. So here, hoping they can fix it. AU expects network usage to be way up tomorrow as students return to campus. I.J. Hudson, News 4 Washington. There's much more to come on News 4 at 6. There's a break in the case of a church pastor gunned down at a gas station. Also, we'll find out what could force some of our area's best doctors to leave for good. What's in a name? Sometimes not much, but when you're naming a high school and the name Ronald Reagan comes up, you may have a controversy on your hands. I'm James Adams in Stafford County, Virginia. I'll have more just ahead. Tonight, can he overcome tragedy to grab gold in Athens? 
Plus, tough questions in the swift boat controversy. NBC Nightly News tonight.